we gathered for another sculpture forum and we've been to see an exhibition of, of work, early work, by Richard Hunt up at the White Tube Gallery on Madison Avenue and I am joined by the usual crew, Jock Ireland and Brad Jumso, and we're delighted to have with us on this occasion Sam Nichols. Sam is a sculptor and he, he at one point when he was a young man, he was still a young man, but when he was a much younger man he did some work with Richard Hunt, so he's going to give us a lot of insight here. Mm. Um, I, I was delighted to see this show, I was delighted by it, I didn't know this work, um, I had seen some work of Richard Hunt's before but nothing like this, um, and I'm going to just open it up. Uh, Sam, would you like to start? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I've seen a lot of this work, but I've, I've seen most of it in his studio here and there talked about so it was interesting to see it you know presented in a very clean environment um hmm. i was also you know my experience with richard was always you know we were working on large public pieces so it was uh one or two assistants and you know doing a lot of fabricating for him um and but he, it's, it's always interesting to see the work that he made pretty much solo like the more intimate work that he was doing um, and kind of how that informed a lot of the, the aesthetic of the of the later work. So. Well, were you working for him at this period? I mean, this is work from what, 1950 something through to 1966 or somewhere about that. Yeah, 69. Yeah, it was the mid mid uh, late 90s. Mm -hmm. when I worked for him. Mm -hmm. But some of this work was around in the studio at the time. Yeah. Yeah, this this and a lot of work like it. I mean, he was yeah. incredibly prolific, and mm. um, he had this enormous power station as a as a studio, and you know, you would just be moving through it and just find all kinds of you know stuff yeah. tucked here, tucked there. There's a recent book published. Oh, it's a pretty big, but I forget who published it. But in there, they show a f aerial photo of the studio, and it's nice and clean. You know, the sculptures placed about. Um, <clears throat> but when I worked for him, you had to walk through a, a, a small little alley around all the stuff to get to the, yeah. to the you know to the project you were working on. I mean, he had he surrounded himself with things that he found interesting or collected. I mean, he had stacks of news of well, newspapers, okay. and one of the assistants once said, you know, you know. Can we get rid of these or whatever? He said, no, no, I want to, you know, clip articles out. Like, he was, he just, he loved to surround himself with, with these things. And he would just have stacks of material, you know, like, like these linear pieces out of uh, tubing and bicycle parts. You know, he would just have mountains of this stuff. But, you know, these power stations were decommissioned when they installed the subway and got rid of the, the trolley cars, whatever they were called. And... Uh, I think it was after he came back from the service, he went to the School of the Art Institute, and then he and another gentleman bought this building from the city, and they converted into their studio. But it was this, you know, they had these huge dynamos, you know, in this building, and of course those were gone, but, so he had to cover all that with these huge plates of steel, and, but he had so much stuff in the studio. Um, that he had to use the 20 ton bridge crane to take out a garbage can all the way to the back dock. Like it was, <laughs> um, but it was really great. It was a great working environment. Um, it was a lot, of, a lot of fun. And just to watch him work, you know, he would, he would come back from a meeting, you know, put his suit jacket on the stack of newspapers and climb up on the ladder of the scaffolding and, you know, start shaping the metal and having us weld it and two hours later he had to leave for another meeting so he was you know he was a real hands-on yeah. uh, sculptor very much uh, committed to you know to materials I think that you know he's from the school that he made you know especially this work kind of to see where it would go he would you know kind of make work to figure out what he was thinking or that type of stuff. So it was really beneficial for me as a young sculptor to, you know, not just 
watch him but work with him and just listen to his thought process and mm. so and he had a great sense of humor um, yeah I think the sense of humor comes across in the work yeah that hands-on quality too it really does feel arrived at I'd sort of never heard of him before and uh, I walked into the uh, white cube and felt completely at home uh, you know as if I'd known this guy or known mm -hmm. the work forever I, I, as, a, as I understand things he um, as a very young guy he got involved with art schools um, and he, you know was educated or uh, made clay figures as a teenager uh, uh, and this work is, I think he's in his 20s maybe in s with some of them, but uh, uh, th there's still, th there's a head, there's a dancing figure, and that it just it reminds me of the studio school and the Mercedes uh, insisting on students uh, making figures uh, and the way that might support painting but in this case, it supports a whole uh, lifetime of making sculpture. But he, he, he knew about working, um, looking at something and, and doing something with some other material, transforming that clay into a figure, but transforming uh, his metal stuff. Uh, from a, some, from an impulse that comes from working uh, in clay with a figure, but I, as I say, I felt completely at home with this and delighted by the way he transformed things, uh, uh, and, and it was just a wonderful introduction to something new or for me. Yeah, I, 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 w I was delighted by, by the show. I, I, I must say I'm um, really kind of uh, very surprised and, and, and I, 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 I found the overtly figurative work, the overtly representational work, the least interesting uh, of, of the things in the show. That's not to say they weren't important, mm, or important yeah. to him or an important part of his is his practice, um, but but they, they they didn't they didn't have for me the kind of I don't know generosity, uh, playfulness, uh, uh, unpredictability. It was um, such a contrast to, and a surprising kind of encounter to see this show after the last show we talked about the David Smith. Um, and such a contrast from Smith. I mean, when I found myself, you know, th thinking about my my pleasure in this work, and and my pleasure in the Smith work, it was of a different order, but but equally, no. I think, uh, engaging and 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 uh, intriguing. Uh, it impressed me that the work in this show was made from like his like twenties to thirties like early 20s to early 30s yeah. and it really it's like it was more fluent than Smith at that age. Mm -hmm. Smith's work at that time he was you know far more laborious like really trying hard and I was I was just really struck by his his fluency his, his sheer talent. Yeah I mean I found what I found <clears throat> most or interesting about work from from this era and particularly the show is like how lyrical it is and how kind of poetic in way ways that you can move through it like he had a real sense of line in space and but it was punctuated by you know certain forms that he was and how you could kind of move through the piece you know to find work meaningful you find yourself in the work somehow you're able to enter it and i yeah. think he the work is incredibly inviting in a certain way not just in the tactility but also like the you know some of the formal elements but the way that you can move through the work and the way that you know from the totemic stuff that's more figuratively mm -hmm. 
uh, presented to the perhaps the the more tubular stuff that could almost be looked at as like a landscape. Talking about you know clay, like he he worked steel, bronze, and you know aluminum and whatever as if it was, like he had a real uh, control of the material. He really knew how to make to mold it and shape it. Um, and I think that's really evident in a lot of this work. But in contrast to Smith, he had this sense of volume that I found really appealing and, and pleasurable. These uh, kind of modeled surfaces that would add up to enclosed yeah. form that you yeah. don't get in Smith. Yeah. And I think also, you know, Smith, if you, you know, a lot of his work is, is viewed from a particular it places the viewer at a particular spot. You're looking at it almost as if it's a Pain. pictorial, right. Yeah. Where with Richard's work, I mean, it's, it's spatial. Yeah. It, yeah. it occupies space. It goes far beyond the, the pictorial plane. You, could, you yeah. could interact with it from just about any, and I, that's what I mean by he provides an entrance to the work that you can yeah. move yeah. yourself through it visually and find yeah. poetic moments. So. It's quirky too, isn't it? I mean, there's, a, there's kind of such kind of odd, strange little things happening when you spend time with one of these pieces. Um, and the, the quirkiness seems personal to me. It's not like uh, he brings a, uh, a cranky agenda no, to his work. No, and, it, and, it, and it's consistent mm -hmm. throughout. There's this kind of a, um, just continual sense of Surprise, I found, you know. Um, yeah, constant uh, discovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Um, and, and he could enter that without trying to finish anything, without, it, it's, um, there, there's a yeah. real yeah. big confidence that's yeah. subdued. It, it, yeah, it, it's, yeah, I, I, yeah. Ha I mean, I have to just say, I didn't think, the, I thought the work was uneven. I mean, in this show, um, d delighted as I was, it, it, it did seem to me that there were some pieces that, that uh, you know, just didn't feel like they belonged in, in the same room. But it was starting from a guy at 20. Yes. I mean, wow. Yes. When I think of my work at 20 and... Huh. Yeah, I was, I was, I've gone downhill since then. I was good at 20. <laughs> I like the pieces that were horizontal and tubular, especially. Yeah. Yeah. And that they had it's such a light. Uh, they alighted so lightly on the ground. Uh, you know, like yeah. they all did. three they maybe the four way, points. The way they touched the ground was always very, you know, considered and and, and you know, almost deft. And even the the basiest pieces didn't have the kind of awkward no. base that no. Smith sometimes has, where it's really like yeah. finger in the eye. Yeah. Um, that that piece that, it, on the second floor in the in the on its own in that little front room, I think it was called uh, opposed linear forms. That was that was a really fantastic piece. But I agree with you, Jock, that um, he has a quality that's not as self-assertive as, as Smith. Well, I, I, one of the things that I got a sense of in, in, this, in most of this work is just this guy talking to himself, you know? I mean, yeah. He's not talking to an audience. He's not, whereas Smith, I think, is in some way, generally has a, you know, a, the presence of a, a world out there that he is engaged. Whereas I felt here is this guy is, you know, he's on his own and, and he's not expecting uh, people to be paying that much attention, at least in, this, in this world. There's a kind of quietness almost verging on diffidence. Yes. Yeah. The, the meditative and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, self-reflective, but, it, and but it's not—it's not all self. It, they, he's engaged with something bigger than himself. No, I wasn't implying that it was, yeah. it, that it was 
uh, narcissistic or self-indulgent or anything like that. No, no, no. no I, th the, um, I think he's playing with a lot of things, you know, that he's seen and enjoyed and thought about, and and the stuff. I mean, just the stuff seems to inspire him. The material. Yeah. But there's um, it. This is early work, and I, I don't. It, know much about his career except I do know that he um, uh, lived a long life but uh, but he also made uh, over a hundred and fifty big public sculptures um, and and the big public sculptures to the extent that I'm aware of them through uh, photographs are sort of epic as opposed to lyrical and I wonder, Sam, do you, did he ever talk about that? The, the, just the, the massiveness to some extent of the big public things versus these? <clears throat> well, I mean, you have to, you know, my interaction with him was through me being his assistant. And, yeah. yeah. But we would talk about him, but, you know, he never really formally, you know, talked about him the way he might talk to, you know, giving a gallery talk or talking to a prospective yeah. client or whatever um, and then you know he did like the Harold Washington library in Chicago this huge yeah. facade you know he he did a lot of large pieces and I think there's always a risk when you begin to make work like that that you know all the restraints and requirements engineering to yeah. city planners to uh, review boards or all that stuff have an influence on that sure and I always felt like when Richard was in the studio working on the work they were outside I forget the the piece but the one piece that I worked on quite a bit it was for a, a church of some sort they commissioned and he'd been working on it for like four years yeah so and and they did two visits so people came by and they were looking at it you know and they, yeah, they weren't really sure about you know I don't know if we're you know and and you know Richard he just kept making the way he made like he 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 allowed I mean he was realistic in the sense that he yeah. he you know had it to uh, you know support himself or whatever but you know he he did seem to have a way to huh. you know th that part of of making and and developing uh, artistically was was sacred uh -huh. it wasn't to be you know yeah um, but you know, in Chicago, there's works all over the place. But they do tend to be more volumetric, and you yeah. know, it's it's a much different uh, approach because they are made for for public. Yeah. Where like like what you all been talking about earlier is that these do seem to be more. I mean, they certainly appear to me to be more intimate work. And the one piece that that struck me was. Um, Hero's Head, which was, yeah, because he he was he attended uh, Emmett Till's funeral. It was, yeah, um, and just you know, I was looking at this piece and I could, like, I guess in a lot of this work, I see a lot of art history. I see a lot of like, because like Otto Dix, right, the, who yeah. did the, you know, the, that aesthetic was present in that head. But, um, and then you know, some you know, you can just start going through a lot of art history, but somehow he was able to let that pass through him yeah. without yeah. mimicking and without yeah. right. he allowed it to to kind of he used it you know perhaps as a source of inspiration or whatever but not, but didn't i'm going to make a this piece or i'm going to make a that piece he yeah, yeah right. so he was aware but he was right. also able to yeah to have that dialogue with the material with where the material and the shapes and the process and how, yeah. where it was going to Kind of see that through. So, yeah. I, I I have a technical question. Or uh, a lot of the tube-like things have residue of carbon. Is that right, Sam? I don't know my. Perhaps or yeah or a, a lot of black scattered, and and I've noticed the same thing with uh, uh, Tony Smart. His metal pieces. He you know he welds them I don't know what the tools he uses but he there's a residue 
And he's very sort of precious about leaving that, not cleaning it up. And uh, it, it was that something that uh, uh, Hunt did, or was he? Uh, is it something that all sculptors, uh, metal sculptors, are sort of conscious or have some? Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, well, I think what I mean, I can't speak for all metal sculptors, but I, I think you know he would. And again, I didn't I didn't know him when he was making these pieces, but based on my knowledge and history with uh, metalwork, you know, yeah, the welds weren't cleaned up. So they, you know, when you weld, especially if something's been chromed or whatever, you'd have to remove that to yeah. weld it. But yeah. also, those things give off, yeah. they convert, right? So if yeah. you're, like, he had some pieces of galvanized pipe in there, and when you weld that, you burn yeah. the zinc off and it makes a white blush. Yeah. And you, you can remove it, um, but you know, with the exception of a few pieces in here, he didn't seem to really uh, be too concerned with polishing and cleaning yeah, and, and right, that. Yeah, yeah. He kind of let the process emerge and be part of that yeah. piece. And I imagine he responded to that as he moved through the pieces, so. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I did have a question looking at some of this work about, you know, it's quite old some of it, and I, 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 I speculated that somebody's, you know, done a clean-up job on much of it, and some steel wall and a bit of this and a bit of that, you know, to whatever condition it was in uh, before it came to the White Field Gallery, I think it has to have undergone some, some kind of restoration. Um, I didn't. I mean, I didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't intrusive or anything. But but I I, I did speculate that, uh, you know, that perhaps it wasn't in the condition in which it was when he left it. it yeah. In terms of that kind of residue of of, mm -hmm. of, of, of welds and what have you. I mean, I imagine that you know maybe they they dusted them off or wiped them down, but I wouldn't. Yeah. I, I didn't see any evidence of them trying to. Yeah, it's a, a small point, but it was my sort of connection to uh, uh, sculptors who are still metal sculptors, steel metal yeah. sculptors who are still alive and working and the horizontality that uh, Brant was talking yeah. about is something that you know Robin Greenwood uh, yeah but it's interesting to me though because I, you know I, I didn't have it I wasn't conscious in this show that this is a metal sculptor. Uh -huh. is, you know, I mean, yeah. clearly is, and clearly, you know, he uses other materials as well. I mean, there's chunks of wood and other things in there, but, but, but I didn't. It didn't feel to me, you know, that this is coming within that category of welded steel sculpture. You know, that that has now become very familiar. It it, it didn't fall within that somehow. It's much too organic, uh, and 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 uh, the material is 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 used in such a kind of um, fluid and, and uh, elegant uh, and playful way that it, you know, it almost didn't feel like steel. It felt like, you know, almost like something that had grown or oozed out of somewhere or, you know, tied itself in a knot here. And, you know, it, it, it seemed to have so much variety and, and, uh, I, I, surprise! It, I, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't come away from. I didn't. When I was in there, I wasn't thinking another welded steel sculpture or another abstract sculpture. I, I, you know, um, the the sense that which this thing that I call spirit is embodied and is um, is the driving force of this work is um, a connection that is confident, even though it's, you know, I, I don't like the sort of flaky talking about mm -hmm. spirit and all that stuff. But, but, but the thing is that it's concrete, it's real, it's, mm -hmm. um, and, and it distinguishes his work from so much, you know, a really immediately 
fell in love with this kind of stuff. You know, it engaged me completely. Uh, uh, and, and that doesn't happen every time I walk into a gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I agree about the material. I mean, it's, um, I have several friends who are glass artists, you know, and they always yeah. talk about the ooh wow quality of glass. Like mm -hmm. you can't get beyond the fact that this is glass or that, yeah. right, that, that the material seemed to uh, connect with his sensibility of exploring sculptural space. And yeah. the, the material was, was seems to be more in service of that endeavor than, you know, making something to show that it was made out of metal, which yeah. which I think gives it a, uh, it's quite refreshing to see it, especially in person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I forget when, you know, Martin Purrier was in Chicago uh -huh. later, but not too much later, you know, and I can, you know, see a lot of relationships between uh, the forms, you know, where yeah. Richard Hunt could achieve those or realize those in metal and, and some wood and compared to Martin Purrier where he would realize those in wood. I mean, it was, yeah. but um, it's similar playfulness or yeah. uh, the imagination, letting the imagination kind of move yeah. you forward. Yeah, and the ladders are, uh, they're, they're hanging pieces and Purrier's ladders. Yeah. I, I, they're, uh, it, could, it could be a connection there as well in terms of just a kind of care in terms of craft and, and uh, you know, the, the making something and making it well. Yeah, but not being fussy. Yeah, but not, no, not, yeah. The, not, yeah. 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 Um, There's a lot of modeling in these pieces though, although, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, it's all, um, fabricated, hammered, welded. Um, even in the, the most linear ones, there were some linear elements that went from tube stock to something modeled in volume, yeah. changing in silhouette. Yeah, that, that was very surprising to see, you know, a, a linear thing develop a kind of block of some kind and then move on to another linear. Yeah, that's what I meant by like the, punctua the, the punctuation of it. Like you kind of, you move through the piece yeah. and you yeah. slow down on this mm -hmm. and then it moves you along again. And then at some distance in silhouette, they're almost like some kind of cursive handwriting. Mm -hmm. Calligraphy <clears throat> or mm -hmm. yeah. mark making. Yeah. But they were very sophisticated, kind of unpredictable um, spatial intersections where things um, appeared to overlap and didn't actually meet or, you know, ran parallel or, um, you know, came off in, um, you know, some kind of branching fashion that involved three-dimensional space. It seems like... Um, a, a real difference in sensibility between Hunt and Smith is a, a three-dimensional occupation in Hunt that was just natural to him. Yeah, these things are grasped as, as you know, spatial things. They're not mm -hmm. images in the sense of offering you a profile or a, a silhouette or, a, you know, they, they very much... Yeah, they almost dictate that you move around. The and that was one of the things about the show that I did not enjoy was that was, for the most part we couldn't get around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to the sign. Uh, the work is all kind of on platforms that are attached to the walls of the gallery so you can't walk behind the sculptures or really see behind them. It was good going all the way around the piece at the, In the top of the stairwell yes, on that, that kind was, of... And that was uh, maybe, I said, my favorite, yeah. my favorite piece in the show, but that was maybe just because I could walk all around it. But it seemed essential, what, you know, to walk around that thing and find it constantly uh, surprising you, surprising me. Joyful. Mm -hmm. Joyful. Yeah, it's a good word. 
Very good. Anybody got anything else you need to say? Thank you guys for including me. It was, it was yeah. great to have the show. Yeah. Okay. Get a chance to talk about Richard. Yeah, thanks yeah. for joining us. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. It's great to hear your sense of him and your memory of working in that great barn of a... <laughs> power station. I, I saw the picture of it, it looked enormous. Yeah, and it had an entire basement too. Yeah. Full of, he had this unbelievable African art collection. Just, mm -hmm. and he had, you know, one of the most interesting things he had was a, A, it was a, did a trip to Alaska and, you know, up that way or whatever, but he, he had this raincoat made out of seal intestine. It was it's this beautiful <laughs> translucent thing. I mean, oh. just like he just collected stuff that he responded to. Oh, that he, yeah. you know, and I think he collected materials and like from the bumpers to the tubing to chunks of wood. Like he responded to them, and then yeah, you know, yeah. they both moved forward to the process. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm.